Welcome, and I hope you're all well. And that's, I think, the biggest thing now because classes are, are taking a backseat to, to reality or much more important things in life. So, um, we, you know, we have a lot to do today. So I let, let's, let's get started. You know, it's been a week and a half since the, since the last session, and you might have forgotten what we were talking about, but we were talking about stock-based compensation and how to deal with it in valuation. And I said, if it's restricted stock, your life just got a little easier because with restricted stock, all you need to do is adjust the share count and you're done. But I talked about dealing with, op with, uh, with grants in the past and grants in the future, right? So if you have restricted stock in the past, it's already near share count. If you have options in the past, I said, you've got to value those options as options and reduce them from a value of equity. So I was talking about the two alternative approaches. One is what I call the bludgeon approach. We try to adjust the share count for options outstanding, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work because it counts the shares, but it doesn't count the exercise value. You got the ex the treasury stock approach where you count in. You know, in, in case you, you know my audio starts to go out or you have any issues, just uh, put it in the chat because otherwise I have no way of knowing if I'm completely gone. Now, the second approach is the treasury stock approach, where what you do is you count the shares outstanding from the options, but you also count in the exercise proceeds as part of the value. What it effectively does is it values the options at exercise value. And I said that's probably going to undervalue the options because options have a time premium. So the last thing I talked about before we ended before the spring break was I said the right way to deal with options that have been granted is to value them as options and take them out of the value of your equity. So let's talk a little bit about option pricing in the context of valuing employee options. One of the problems is the op traditional option pricing models, whether it's black shoals or binomial, were designed to value short-term options on listed stock which means that the, the maturity of the option was three, four, five months. You could assume that the variance was pretty much unchanged during that period. And you could also assume that exercising the option itself would not affect the stock price. Unfortunately, employee options are different on many counts. First, they're much more long term, five years, 10 years. 10 years is pretty standard. Second, the process of exercising the option itself can affect the stock price. Why? Because when employees exercise options, the share count actually can go up, which can affect the price per share. There are some people who've used this as an argument for not using option pricing to value employee options, but that's not really appropriate. I think you can adjust or adapt option pricing models to reflect the fact that options, employee options are long term and that their exercise can affect the value per share. So I use a modified version of the Black Shoals, and I'm going to use it to take that example that we just dealt with to value the employee options that you gave to the CEO. Remember the 10 million options? So here's what I did. I took the strike price at $10, but instead of using the stock price of $10, I adjusted for the fact that if you exercise these options, the price per share will drop to 9.58. So that's the first adjustment. I'm adjusting the price for expected dilution. There's, an, there's a spreadsheet and you can see this work out in the spreadsheet if you get a chance online. I'm using a 10 year maturity, though you could argue that maybe with employee options, I, I should use a lesser maturity. And here's why. Normally with listed options, you never exercise before expiration. Why? Because you can always sell the option to somebody else at a higher price. There's a, there's a time premium. With employee options, that's difficult to do. You're stuck with those options. So employees tend to exercise options before maturity. In fact, typically, you know, employee options get exercised about halfway towards their life. So when you have a 10 year life, you could use five years to reflect the fact that employee options get exercised earlier. And then the rest of the model, I use traditional black shows. Using this approach, the value that I get per option, and you can see that is $5.42 per option. So what do I do with this? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the 10 million options were granted, multiply by 542, I get $54.2 million as the value of the options were granted. Remember the original problem, we'd value the equity in the company at a billion? 54.2 million of that value has been given away to the CEO as compensation. So I subtract out the 54.2 million to come up with the value of equity in the remaining shares of 945.8 million. I divide by the shares outstanding, 100 million, I get the value per share of 946. So let me reframe how this problem looked. You had 10 million shares valued at $10 per share. The company, I'm sorry, 100 million shares valued at $10 per share. The company granted 10 million at the money options to its CEO. Right after the exercise, your value per share drops to 946. 
So this is the way you deal with options that have already been granted is you value them as options, reduce them from a value of equity. Incidentally, I've built this option spreadsheet into my all of my my firm, my discounted cash flow models that you can download off my spreadsheet. So if you enter the numbers for the options, I'll do the dirty work for you, applying the option pricing model, but recognize what I'm doing. I'm valuing your options as options, netting them out of the value of equity you get for your company and dividing by the actual number of shares. Do not double count. You know what I mean by double counting? Don't subtract out the value of the options and adjust the share count for options outstanding. So that's why I've left the share count at the 100 million, not adjusted for the 10 million. So let me summarize. If you have options that have already been granted, you can use the bludgeon approach, in which case you're going to undervalue your shares because you just adjust the share count. You can use the treasury stock approach where you overvalue the shares because you're ignoring the time premium of the options. Or you can use the, the just right approach, basically the Goldilocks approach, which is to value the options as options, net them out from the value of your equity and divide by the share count. So that's how you deal with options and restricted stock that have already been granted. One final issue with options is when options actually get exercised, companies do get a tax advantage. They're allowed to claim that that difference between the, the stock price and the, and the exercise price as a tax deductible expense. An easy way to deal with this is just multiply the value of your options by one minus the tax rate and you've after tax the value of the options. Final point, many companies are not done granting employee stock-based compensation, whether it's restricted stock or options. You're saying, what do I do about the fact that my firm will continue to give options, continue to give restricted stock in the future? Well, deal with it for what it really is. I mean, employee options and restricted stock are granted by companies as part of compensation. And what do we do with the rest of compensation expenses? We treat them as operating expenses and reduce income. And my recommendation is if you expect your company to keep granting options and restricted stock in the future, estimate what the value of those, those grants will be as a percentage of revenues. And this is increasingly easy to do because accounting starting in 2007 has been doing the right thing. They've been treating options as expenses in the years that they're granted, not in the years that they're exercised. So it's already embedded in your cost of goods sold, allowed to continue in the future. So you're actually, it looks like you're punishing the company twice, right? Once by reducing your future income for expected option grants, and then by reducing the value of equity by the value of options granted in the past. But remember, you're dealing with two separate issues. When you reduce future income and future cash flows for option grants, you're dealing with options that you think will be given in the future or restricted stock that will be given in the future. When you're subtracting out the value of options already given, you're dealing with the deadweight cost of options that have been given in the past. This way, a company that is doing that has both problems, you deal with the, the, them separately. Example would be a company like Cisco. Massive option grants in the future, so you've got that deadweight cost. It continues to give options to its employees, so there's a second expense. There are some companies where it's only going to be the deadweight cost and some companies where it's all about options in the future. So preserve your capacity to deal with both stock-based compensation in the past and stock-based compensation in the future. Now, I know that's a lot to get at you right after you come back from break. So I'm just going to take a pause and allow for any questions related to stock-based compensation. Because I think the current practice of adding back stock-based compensation to come up with things like adjusted EBITDA is incredibly short-sighted and it misses the point. So I think that we firmly need to push back against that practice and deal with stock-based compensation for what it really is. It's an operating expense. It lowers your earnings and your cash flows and has to be dealt with as such. So I'm going to open the forum for any questions. You can um, you can either put it in as a question in the chat or ask me a question. Just unmute yourself and ask me the question. But um, I'll give you a couple of minutes to think of any questions you might have related to stock-based compensation. Uh, for Go ahead, Pear. The final and the quizzes is valuing the options of fair game like we even know how to value options do you, yes it will be fair game on both the on the final and the quizzes but i will give you the the only part of option pricing models that's messy is that cumulative normal distribution so i will give you a cumulative normal distribution if i give you an option pricing problem on either the if it's on a quiz it'll probably be on the second quiz and on the final exam so 
If I do give you a question related to options, it'll be mostly on the final exam, not on the second quiz. In the second quiz with employee options, I'll do the dirty work for you. And remember with the quiz, you have your laptop, right? So unlike on the quizzes you'd have been taking in classrooms where you were stuck with just open book, open notes, you, you have the laptop and, you know, it, so you have more, more tools at your disposal. You can open up Excel and do stuff if you want. Any other questions? Go ahead. I can't, if, if somebody's talking, I, okay. I don't hear any more questions. So if there are no more questions, um, w w I'm going to move on to the next part of the class. And this is to me the- Good question. Yeah, go ahead. So if you were doing a model, the way that you would model your stock-based comp would be to take like a historical value, mm -hmm. like a historical average. It's all, but remember, you don't even have to, yeah. You, it, it's it's embedded already in your operating expenses because as I said starting in 2007 your operating expenses reflect what you know options granted that year valued using an option pricing model and subtracted out that year so pre-2006 you had to do the dirty work yourself of estimating how much was granted each year but in in the last decade it's become much simpler so it's already in there the question you got to ask yourself is if you have a really small company as it grows will the option grant expense as a percentage of revenues decrease? And it's probably going to. So when you talk about improving margins, one of the reasons your margins might improve is not that your company would stop granting options, but the value of those options as a percent of revenues will get smaller as the company gets bigger. Right. Okay, so you use black shows to value them somewhere, and then you basically just put that in your opex as a percentage of revenues. And, and in fact, you don't even have to do the black shows, right? The accountants have already done it for you. Yeah, yeah, it's somewhere. Yeah. Okay, yeah. got it. It's embedded in there already. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go on to the next phase, which is about connecting stories to numbers. And if you remember when we started the class, I talked about how this was the biggest hidden secret in valuation, that every valuation, you're telling a story, whether you like it or not and that you need to connect your story to numbers. I described a good valuation as a bridge between stories and numbers. And if you remember, the way I described it is when you send in your Excel spreadsheet with the valuation of your company. There, I've nagged you about, hey, you got to value your company. But when you do that, and I look at your Excel spreadsheet, and I look at your revenues in year 10. So let's say you're valuing Netflix, and you show me revenues of 100 billion in year 10. And I say, where did the 100 billion come from? I want you to tell me a story about Netflix that explains 100 billion. Or when you give me margins of 25% for Zoom, I want to ask, I want to hear the story you're telling me about Zoom that allows it to have 25% margins. Every number in your spreadsheet have a story behind it, and every story you tell about your company should have a number behind it. That's what gives valuations their have. And I said, if you don't do this, you're going to wallow in your own delusions. If you're naturally a number cruncher, you're going to think adding more decimals, putting more line items will give you a more precise valuation, and it's doing nothing of the sort. And if you're a storyteller, you're going to tell me bigger and bigger stories about the company, but they're going to be fairy tales. You're in fantasy land. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you through the process of connecting stories to numbers. It's a process I've developed for myself simply because I'm a natural number cruncher. Left to my own devices, I want to open spreadsheets and enter numbers. So I almost train myself to go through this process because it's the only way I can stay disciplined. It's a five-step process. The first step in the process, you give me any company to value, whether it's Casper or whether it's uh, Conical. My first step is to serve what I call surveying the landscape. Put simply, in order to value a company, you need to understand what it does. What does it make? What, what are its products and services? Who are its customers? Why do they like it? What, is, what does the competition look like? What does the market look like? And that's basically what I mean by landscape. You're saying, well, how do I get this started? I mean, you can go to Capital IQ and download numbers for every company in your sector. That's a good, that's a good place to start, but it shouldn't be the place you end. 
I would suggest reading up as much as you can about the company. Talking to people actually use the company's products. I remember when I valued Beyond Meat, the first thing I did before I even sat down to enter numbers in a spreadsheet is I went to the grocery store. You know why I went to the grocery store? Because I had to buy a pack of Beyond Meat burgers to taste them. Because how can you value a company that claims to be meat, meatless meat without ever tasting its product? So you've got to get a sense of the company, not just in terms of numbers, but in terms of what it is as a company. Because if you don't understand the company, the market and the competition, your story is going to go off kilter. It's easier in some companies than others. If you're valuing um, a steel company, the sector is pretty much set in stone. There's not much movement. But if you're valuing Zoom, you're going to see that this particular part of the process can actually take you a a large amount of time because in a sense it's creating a market that hasn't existed before the online meeting market is still evolving so you have to understand how the market is evolving and everything you collect is fair game okay so here's what i'd like to do i'd like to take a company through this process so you can understand exactly what's involved in surveying the landscape and essentially converting what you learn into a story the company I'm going to use is Uber in June of 2014. Just to give you some perspective. The first time I valued Uber was in June of 2014. In fact, I'd never heard of Uber until early June. Tells you how much I lived underground. I lived in the city. I took subways everywhere. I never took car service. So I remember reading a news story. It was probably June 3rd or 4th of 2014. And here's what the news story said. A company called Uber had raised money from venture capitalists $3 billion from venture capitalists who had priced the company at $17 billion. Priced the company. Notice the word I use, priced. Venture capitalists don't value companies, they price them. They price the, price the company at $17 billion. And I was surprised. I was surprised that a company I'd never heard of had a $17 billion price tag. So I said, I need to find out what they do. Let me take that back. I said I'd never heard of the company. That was technically not true. I'd seen the word Uber on my credit card statements for the two months leading into June of 2014 because it turned out that my son who was going to college in North Carolina was using Uber and using my credit card to back it up. Don't ask me how that happened. But, um, uh, you know, uh, I, th I thought he was taking German language classes. You know, there's no umlaut on the U. That should have given it away. So the first person I called when I read this Uber story was my son. But he was still sleeping. It's only, it was only 11.30 in the morning. Well, he kept what I call college student hours, which is you wake up whenever you feel like waking up and you go to bed whenever you feel like going to bed. And the setting and the rising of the sun has nothing to do with it. So he wasn't picking up his phone. So I called my niece who lived and worked in Chicago. And since she was working, she had to be technically awake. What does technically awake mean? She was at her desk. Her eyes were open. She was in a horrifically bad mood. She says, what do you want? This is how she greets me. I said, have you heard of this company called Uber? She said, yes, it's a ride-sharing company. And I said, what the heck is a ride-sharing company? And she said, I don't have the time to tell you. Why don't you just download the app and find out for yourself? I said, okay. So I downloaded the app sitting in my New York City office. I hit the Uber app. Magical things start to happen on my smartphone. First, the GPS opens up and I see a car trying to drive towards me. Why trying to? But it's New York City. You don't get from point A to point B. You try to get from point A to point B. I can see the car zigging and zagging, trying to get to 44 West 4th Street. And I can see a name in the car. It says George. It never happened to me with a yellow cap. Fascinated, I watch George and his car driving to 44 West 4th Street. Ten minutes later, he gets there. I run out of the car and say, hi, George. He said, where are you going? You didn't enter a destination. And I said, nowhere in particular. Can you drive me around for about 30 minutes? I have some questions to ask you. He thought for a moment that I was a serial killer, but then he said, I can take this guy. Get in the back, he said. And so I started asking him questions. I said, is this, your, is this an Uber car you're driving? He said, no, this is my car. And I said, are you an Uber employee? He says, I'm an independent contractor. And I said, why do you do this? He said, I have a regular job. I don't make enough income. I already own this car. I pay insurance on it. Uber allows me to make a second income to supplement my regular income. And I remember asking him, do you tell your insurance company you're doing this inside? And he said, what they don't know can't hurt them. So at that point, I kind of understood why this guy drove for Uber. I said, in fact, I remember asking, why do you need Uber? And he said, in New York City, it's illegal to stop on the street and op offer somebody a ride. Uber connects me with customers. 
So at this point, I could see why this guy, the drivers, liked Uber. It allowed them to connect with customers and use something they already own to earn a second income. I said, okay. The, the second part, and, and, and I remember getting out of the car, this was you know, 25 minutes later, and offering to pay him. And he said, you don't have to pay me. I said, really? It's free? He said, no, it's not free. You know, you paid, no, when you entered, downloaded the app, did you enter a credit card? And I said, yes, and this, and he said, they'll charge you. And I remember asking, how do you get paid? He said, well, they'll send me 80% of the fare. I remember asking why 80%? He said, I don't know, that's what they all do, and he drives off. At this stage, I could, I could see why Uber did what they did for connecting cars to customers, essentially acting as a broker. They got to keep 20% of the fare. That's a sweet business to be in. Which left me with one final loose end. Why do people like my son and my niece like Uber? So I called my son, this time at a civilized time. And I said, what do you like about Uber? And he said, I can call the car from my smartphone. I don't have to get on the street and wave my hand around. And I said, that's pretty civilized. You're right. And I said, but you have to wait forever, right? He said, no, they come sooner than a cab. And I said, you must pay a lot more, right? He said, no, they're cheaper than a cab. I said, the cars must be filthy, right? He said, no, they're cleaner than a cab. I said, let me get this straight. You know, you can call them from your smartphone. They're cheaper than a cab. They're cleaner than a cab. They come sooner than a cab. I knew then that cab service was destined for doom. I could see why ride sharing was going to take off, which left me with one final unresolved question. What's so special about Uber? Why couldn't I buy my own mainframe computer or big computer, go down into my basement and act as a broker? And I could think of two things that Uber had that I did not. One was $3 billion. They had it. I didn't. A little bit of a disadvantage. The second is this is a business with what I call networking benefits. You know what I mean by networking benefits? If you're the largest, let, let's say Uber becomes the largest ride-sharing company in a city and you're a driver who wants to drive for a ride-sharing business and you have two choices. You can go with Uber, the largest ride-sharing company or a startup ride-sharing company. Who are you going to go with? You're going to go where the customers are, which means you're going to go with the largest ride-sharing company. Networking benefits basically means that as you get larger, it gets easier to get larger, which means that if you're first in the business and you can get big quickly, you might be able to keep the competition up. So that I thought was Uber's biggest advantage is because they were one of the first into the business and they'd grown faster than everybody else. They had an advantage over the rest of the competition. So after I was done doing this research, if you can call it research, did I lose my audio? Are you guys okay? Yeah. We lost it for a sec. Okay, so I'm back again, right? So, you know, after I did this research, you can even call it research, I drew a picture of what I'd learned about Uber. I find this useful, especially with young companies. And basically in the picture, here's what I did. I looked, I drew a picture of what, what I saw as their business model, how they made the money, how they split the proceeds, what expenses they faced. It allowed me to understand what Uber was as a company. I did the same thing for Zoom and Casper. So every time I have a young company, Notice what I haven't talked about. You're saying, what do the financials look like for Uber? Well, in 2014, what financials did you have for Uber? It was a private company, very private about its financials. There was not much you could have learned about its numbers because there were not, nothing there. In fact, all I knew about Uber in June of 2014 was the revenues they had in 2013, their gross billings and what percentage they kept for themselves, their net loss. They, they were pretty open about the fact that they were losing money and how many cities they were in. But I'll be quite honest, not having the financials was not a huge handicap because with a young company, what are the financials going to tell you? They have small revenues, big operating losses, big deal. I'd have known that without looking at the financials. What I'm trying to tell you is if any of you are working with young companies, don't look for comfort in the financials. Don't try to compute every ratio you can. It might not help you that much because understanding the company will require leaving the financials and doing your own kind of sometimes informal research. If you're valuing Zoom, no, there's not much you're going to learn by looking at last year's financials, especially how much has transpired since then. So now let's talk about creating a story for the future. So do your research. So think. Of, so before I go there, I'm going to give you a chance to think about what we know. Sammy, go ahead. Okay. So um, if we don't have the, if we don't have enough financials, 
then what in this case why do we go into all these steps for the project or well you have to be, you, the fact that you don't have past financial. financials doesn't mean you, you don't have to project future financials right you still have to project revenues and operating income Right? So in a sense, the story will then drive what those numbers will be. So the fact that you don't have past financials doesn't mean you don't have to do future financials. In fact, you still need to do future financials. And what you're doing in your research is to have at least a basis for making that projection because you don't have the comfort. The problem with valuing stable companies, you can just take past financials and apply growth rates to them. and just You're not doing valuation. You're just doing modeling. You can't do that with young companies. Any other questions? Okay, so let's see, let's move on. So now that we have the kind of background story for your for your company, you now have to create a story for the future. And when you tell the story, a couple of things you want to remember: this is a business story you're telling, not a creative novel. So don't have characters who wander on or wander off for no reason at all. Don't create three-headed dogs. You know, you're not J.K. Rowling, and you don't want to be J.K. Rowling. So I have a couple of pieces of advice as you're constructing a business story for your company. The first is keep your story simple, right? Keep it simple. Second, keep it focused. So on the simple, uh, keep on the keeping the story simple. Let me give you an illustration of a story you don't want to tell about your business. About a decade ago, my oldest son came to me with a reading suggestion. Okay? And he said, Dad, you got to read this book. It's amazing. And he gave me this book. And I almost fell over. The book was so thick and so heavy. So I took a look at the front of the book. And it said, The Game of Thrones, George R. R. Martin. I tried. I tried for two weeks to read Game of Thrones. And two weeks later, I remember calling my son saying, Hey, Ryan, I'm too old for this. There are hundreds of characters in this book. They wander on. They wander off. They die. They come back to life. They're good guys. They're bad guys. I give up. Hey, if you're telling a business story, don't make it Game of Thrones. You don't have eight seasons and 80 episodes to tell your story. You have like 15 minutes. So keep it simple. Keep it focused. You know the end game for every business is, no matter what kind of business you are? you got to tell me what your pathway is to making money. Notice, you don't have to tell me you're going to make money next year, but tell me at least you've thought about the possibility that you need to make money and tell me how you plan to make money. So you got this really great downloadable app, amazing for you. But tell me how you're going to make money off that app. Are you going to sell ads on the app? Are you going to sell the app itself? Are you going to create a subscription service? At Did I lose you again for a moment? Am I back now? Just a sec, you're good. Okay. So, so you, you got to tell me how at least you've thought about the pathway to profitability. So keep it simple. Keep it focused. And, and stay grounded in reality. Don't go off into fairy tales. Sometimes you're telling a story and you get so caught up in the story, you might make the story bigger and bigger and bigger. You got to stop when you run into reality checks. So keep it simple, keep it focused, keep it grounded in reality. So I'm going to try to follow my own advice. This was the story I told for Uber in June of 2014. You know why I keep emphasizing June of 2014? Because I have valued Uber every year since 2014. Let me ask you a question. Do you think my story for Uber has changed every year? Yeah, of course it has. Data comes in, the company changes. It's, it's gotten bigger in some ways. It's got more optimistic in some ways, more pessimistic in others. With young companies, your story will evolve over time. So in June of 2014, this was my story. I described Uber and every word in the story is going to play out in my valuation. So hang in there. I described Uber as an urban car service company. So where do I see Uber succeeding in June of 2014? I saw them succeeding in cities and big towns as a car service business, which will expand the business by bringing in young people, people like my son, my son and my niece, bringing in new users. Okay? with local networking benefits. Basically, I talked about networking benefits already. I said if, if a ride-sharing company becomes bigger, it actually gets easier to get bigger. You're saying, what's the local doing in there? Let's say Uber becomes the largest ride-sharing company in New York. At some point, there'll be a tipping point where Uber ends up dominating New York. But let's say I fly from New York to Chicago. Once I land in Chicago, remember, I don't care anymore 
who the largest ride-sharing company in New York is. I care about the largest ride-sharing company in Chicago. So here's what's going to happen. In my world, Uber might end up taking New York, Lyft can take Chicago, Didi can take Beijing, Ola can take Mumbai, and Grab can take Kuala Lumpur. You're saying, who cares? The kind of market share you will see me give Uber will reflect the fact that I think that in this business, there might be as many as eight or nine or 10 different ride-sharing companies dominating different parts of the world. I did assume in June of 2014 that Uber could keep doing what they're doing, which is what? Maintain that 20% of revenues. Remember, that's completely arbitrary. Why 20%? Why not 15? Why not 30? I think Travis Lackney just made it up when he started Uber. He said, no, what should I keep? Oh, how about 20%? That sounds good. I assume that would stay sticky and that they would continue to not own the cars and not hire the drivers. It affects the revenues, the margins, and how quickly they can scale up. So that was my story for Uber. Incidentally, Sanjana asked the question, how do you create narrative for tech companies? First, let's stop using the word tech. Tech becomes a shorthand for everything. Is Tesla a tech company? No. Is Amazon a tech company? Not really. Is Facebook a tech company? No. Tech is just a word we use. Facebook is an online advertising company. Amazon is a disruption machine. And basically the story you tell about the big fang stocks, and this is really not about tech companies specifically, about the big fang stocks, is the stories evolving, right? So Sanjana, I don't know whether that answered your question. When you say, how do you create a narrative? You gotta learn, take everything because these companies have been on the ground for a while. Do you see what they do well, what they do badly? Am I back now? You lost my audio, you said? Yeah, okay, so with the big companies like this, you can look at their history, you can see what you did well and did badly. So let me go, go back. The story you tell would reflect not just what you've learned about, let's take Amazon, classic example. I valued Amazon for the first time in 1997. You know what I valued them as? The story I told was of an online book retailer. That's what they were. Along the way, of course, they changed themselves as a company. I made them an online retailer. For about a dozen years, I valued them as an online retail story. In 2012, they made a sea change again, where they basically took, you know, they, they, they stopped being just a retail business. They started getting into logistics and the cloud business. Today, when I value Amazon, I value it as a disruption machine, which means pretty much everything in the world is fair game. That's my story for Amazon. It, reflects, it, it affects the growth rates I give them, the margins I give them, the value I attach to them. But your story for Amazon could be a very different one. You could basically say Amazon is going to run into a regulatory brick wall and they're not going to be able to get into some businesses. But you have to take the past and craft your own story. That's why a dozen people can value Amazon in this class and come up with 12 very different valuations for the company. So take the history that you have for the companies, take everything you've learned about the company, put your biases as best as you can to the side and craft a story. Do your valuation based on the story, recognizing that you might have to revisit that story. So any questions on the storytelling part? Um, I, I actually do. Go ahead. So you, you say you say you uh, value Amazon and some of these raptors, so what kind of market data you, do you benchmark with? Because there's not much of like a comparison, right? What do you mean what market data? If you're going after the whole market, it's a total market data, right? Your total no, I mean, yeah. What, 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 when For you example, said, building up the beta, what kind of like what, industry? I think you can, you're going to answer the question yourself. If you're in every business, uh, what will your beta converge towards? In entire market. Yeah. In fact, the beta is the least of your worries with Amazon, right? It's not like a beta is going to be 3.3 or 0.3. It's going to be pretty close to 1. That's not your concern. Your concern is going to be... What can stop them? Because if you're in pretty much every market, your revenues are in a sense almost unbounded, right? Because if you're in one market, there's only so much you can grow. An automobile company, it's very difficult to get past 300 or 400 billion. A retail company, it's very difficult to get maybe, you know, Walmart is what, a half a trillion. But if you're in everything, you, you could potentially have revenues of a trillion dollars. There's nothing capping you. So the, pro the problem you're going to face with Amazon is you have to figure out what it is that will stop them from essentially being in every business. And I think the answer is going to be governments and regulators are going to step in. So somewhere in the story, that's got to be the, the kind of speed bump that stops them. But 
when you think about margins and growth and so if you're in every business so amazon is perhaps the most difficult of all companies to value precisely for that reason it's one of the few companies where you're not sure what business it's in it's in every business it could mean any business it's a disruption machine most companies though will come with constraints they're not you know even a facebook you could be online advertising perhaps entertainment but you're not going to be in every business that's not what they're structured to do so most companies will come with constraints on what the story can be make sense okay so everybody comfortable with the story part sammy go ahead Okay, so one more question about the story. Yeah. Um, so in my case, I'm doing a real estate developer business. Very limited uh, story. Very limited story. Your story then has to be whether they stay local. Yes. Or whether they expand it. So w where is your uh, real estate business located? Uh, Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi. Are they going to stay in the Emirates or you see their powers expanding into the Middle East? Because they no, stay. I see them. So, so that's the trick. They're yeah. very limited to yeah. even the Emirates. Itself, that's fine. The state itself. Yeah. Which so means your story case, is going to be a very narrow one, right? Which means that's going to constrain how much they can grow. So it's nice to have a narrow story like yours because you don't have that much room to run. So your revenue part of your story is going to be constrained that there's only so much real estate in the Emirates. Even if you got big, there's only it's, you can get only so big. Your margins are going to be constrained by the real estate business in the Middle East. So when you have a narrow constrained story, that's what's going to happen. At the same time, there is a second part to my question. Yeah. If if I see it very narrow and I see that the revenue stream in a way is very limited, mm -hmm. can I come up or use my my imagination and say they will yeah, eventually... No, 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 don't use your imagination. If they're naturally person. constrained, you can't make them into an Amazon. Don't... No, you, no, no this, not to an yeah. Amazon. Yeah. Amazon, but like feeling that because of that, within two three years, they may end up from switching from a developer to something else. I, but again, no. in the real estate sector, Sammy, if this were your own company, I would encourage you to do it. But this isn't your company. Is it your company? Unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, not. Which which means you got to constrain it. By other managers, the owners, the founders of this company, imaginative people. If you believe they're kind of creative, imaginative people, you can try to devise what you think they will do. If their history is they like to be in control, they like to be focused, they're never going to do it. So don't make your company do I'm, things. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear that. Their history. Uh, their history and then got disconnected. Well, I think that that you have to take into account what kind of managers the company has. You're not running the company, right? The existing management and the family are running the company. If they're not particularly creative, imaginative people, don't make them do things that they would not do on their own, right? So there are some companies I look at, and I valued Indian companies, where I can see where they should be going, but I can't do that for them. So in a sense, when I value the company, I leave them in the businesses they're in, even though they might be bad businesses, terrible growth, because this is not a company capable of taking the kinds of risks to move into a different business. So my long answer to your question is, if you believe the management of this company is the kind of management that will make that kind of leap, then put it in. If not, don't do it just for your own sake, right? And that's why I asked you if it's your own company, I would encourage you to think out of the box of what you can do when your growth runs out. But since it's not your company, you might as well leave them as is. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other que uh, story related questions? Okay. Uh, professor, sorry. Yep. Um, how closely does this story have to match the story that the company is telling? It doesn't have to. Some, if you trust the management and you and you and you believe that they that they stick to their story, then your story might be close to theirs. If you think the management is just making up stuff on the go, and lots of companies, that's the case. They're just giving you hopes rather than expectations. Then feel free. What I do is I listen to management, but I don't talk to managers directly. I listen to management because they're telling stories all the time. I take the parts of the story that I think make sense and I think they're going to stick with. And then I abandoned those parts that I said, look, these managers are incapable of pulling that off. So you can draw what you can from management stories, but you're not stuck staying close to them. There are some companies where your story and the management story is going to be close and other companies we've got to be willing to deviate from their story because you don't trust them. 
No. Can you imagine having a story for Tesla that matches whatever Elon Musk's latest tweet tells you he's going to do? I mean, you'd go crazy. Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on to the next phase. So now you've understood your company and you crafted a story. The next stop, you've got to make sure the story you've told is not a fairy tale. I pass my story through what I call a 3P test. Is it possible? Is it plausible? Is it probable? Sounds like I'm playing on words, right? Lots of things are possible. That's a very low threshold. So if it's impossible, this is the place I stop it. Make sure it's possible. But of those things that are possible, only a subset are plausible. So plausible means that somebody somewhere has done something like this before. And probable means you've done something that shows me you can pull off whatever your story is. Is it possible? Is it plausible? Is it probable? So I'll give you a very simple way of thinking about the difference between possible, plausible, and probable. About um, two and a half years ago, in October of 2017, I think, I was in Latin America uh, for the CFA and I was doing a three-city tour, talking about narrative and numbers, exactly this part of the, the, the notes. And my first day, I was in Sao Paulo, Brazil. The second day, I was in Santiago, Chile. And the third day, I was in Lima, Peru. Right? So I think as I'm pre preparing my presentation, I said, look, I, now I'd like to ask a question of each of these crowds where they can, everybody in the room will have an opinion. So I wanted to pick a topic for each group where everybody would have an opinion. So first day I'm in front of 300 Brazilians and I'm thinking about what can I ask 300 Brazilians where every person in the room will have an opinion. So what's the topic you think I pick where every Brazilian has an opinion? Football. Any ideas? Football, exactly. So here's the question asked. This is six months before the last World Cup. I said, is it possible that Brazil will win the World Cup? You ask 300 Brazilians. Is it possible that Brazil will win the World Cup? What do you think the answer is? Of course. Yes, we won it five times before. I said, okay. Is it plausible that Brazil will win the World Cup? Remember, this is six months before the World Cup. And in October 2017, Brazilians were feeling pretty good again. They were second ranked in the world. The team was playing well. And they said, it's, it's plausible. Did I, did I lose you on my back? No, we're good. You okay. Break up. okay, so good. So I said, is it plausible? But remember, if I'd asked the same question about, is it plausible in December of 2014? The answer might have been very different. You're saying, what happened in 2014? Only somebody who's not a soccer fan would ask that question. Because remember what happened in the 2014 World Series to Brazil? That ill-fated semi-final which they still can't forget against Germany, where they lost, what, 8-2, 7-1, some shellacking for the ages. They were pretty shaky then. But by 2017, as I said, they said it's plausible. Then I said, is it probable that Brazil win the World Cup? And now you could see the wheels go into motion. They said if Neymar is healthy and he doesn't flip and flop and do whatever Neymar does, you know, then it's probable. But you could see with each question, I was raising the ante. So I said, this works so well in Brazil. I'm going to try it tomorrow in Santiago, Chile. I should have done my homework, but I did not. I landed in Santiago and 100 Chileans in the room and asked, is it possible that Chile will win the World Cup? Grown men in the audience start weeping uncontrollably. And I said, what the heck did I do? And it turned out that the week before, Chile had been playing Argentina, had lost 2-1 and had been knocked out of World Cup contention. I think one of the requirements for winning the World Cup is you actually have to be there. And it turns out that for Chile, that was not possible. And if you're not going to be at the World Cup, it's definitely not plausible or probable. So in Chile, it was definitely not possible or, pl or probable. So, no. so when you think about is it possible, is it plausible, is it probable, you're raising the ante each step. So I'll close this off with, with a very personal you know, um, view as a fan. I'm a Yankee fan. So early this year, right after they signed um, Garrett Cole, he asked me, is it possible that the Yankees will win the World Series? I'd have said, of course it's possible. We won it 27 times before. If I asked you, is it plausible? Then I'd say, yeah, you know what? We've got a really good team. Look at us starting pitching. And is it probable, working through the odds, I said, it's, it's probably the odds are really good. It's not 100%, but the odds are really good. 
Now, if you'd asked me four weeks ago before this crisis, you know, things didn't look as good. No, Aaron Judge was injured. You know, it looked like a couple of us starting pitches are down for half the season. You could see how possible, plausible, probable can shift for the same for the same company over time. So when you tell a story, whatever that story is for your company, stop and ask these three questions. Is it possible? Is it plausible? Is it probable? Uh, somebody asked me to adjust my camera. Am I back on camera again? Because um, it's, you know, I, I'm sorry, I'm sitting in a, in a room. I can't see myself. So if I'm off camera, it's okay, good. So now let me give you examples of impossible stories, implausible stories, and improbable stories. Let's start with impossible stories. You know what a fairness opinion is? A fairness opinion usually happens in an acquisition. It's a fig leaf that bankers provide acquirers so that they don't get sued for paying too much. That's the way I describe it. That's not the way the bankers would describe it. So essentially, what 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 you get in a fairness opinion is the is the you know third party appraiser, third party under quotes, a banker, an investment banker will come in, look at the price you're paying for target companies. That price is fair. Given that no deal in history has ever been stopped because you could not could not get a fairness opinion, let's face it, fairness opinions are really fig leaves to cover bad deeds. So I give I cut bankers a lot of slack when it comes to fairness opinions. They break pretty much every rule in the book in valuation in doing fairness opinions. So this was about four, maybe five years ago, when Tesla bought Solar City in one of the most hopelessly conflicted deals of all time. And to see why, think about you know, who the largest shareholder in Tesla is. It's a guy called Elon Musk. Who's the largest shareholder in Solar City? A guy called Elon Musk. What a coincidence. No, it's the same guy. Who's the CEO of Tesla? A guy called Elon Musk. Who's the CEO? Who was the CEO of Solar City? A guy called Musk with a different first name, his cousin. So when Tesla bought Solar City, they knew they were going to get sued and they decided they needed to get protection. They got fairness opinions. In fact, they hired an investment bank called Evercore, a boutique investment bank. You saying what's a boutique investment bank? A boutique investment bank is like a gastropub. You've ever walked by those in an airport? Basically, never go into them because they're burger joints where they triple the price. That's what the gastro part of the name allows them to do. So they call an Evercore. An Evercore does the fairness opinion. In this case, it was an exchange offer. Tesla shares for Evercore, for, um, for Solar City shares. So Evercore had to value both Tesla and Solar City. So Evercore goes to work and they turn out a fairness opinion. So a month later, it's public and I, I'm going through the fairness opinion to see how they justify this deal. Again, expecting them to break some rules. So I look at Evercore's valuation of Tesla and they've done a discounted cash flow valuation at least in name. What do you need for a discounted cash flow valuation? You need cash flows in a discount rate. You know where they got the cash flows? This is Evercore. They got the cash flows from the board of directors of Tesla. You're saying, how did the board of directors of Tesla get the cash flows? They got it from Goldman Sachs Equity Research. What a tangled web we weave. Now, Goldman Sachs was Tesla's native investment bank. They went to their equity research guys. The equity research guys supplied the cash flows to the Tesla board and the Tesla board handed them to Evercore and Evercore just plugged them into a spreadsheet. How this is an opinion of fair, I don't even know. Yeah. But they put those in as cash flows for the next five years. Then they came up with some caustic capital. They did some strange calculations. I kind of ignored that because it wasn't the big driver of the value anyway. But at the end of five years, the cash flows ended and they had to do something after year five. And since they didn't have any cash flows, guess what they did? They assumed a growth rate forever after year five. They're following the textbook, right? Maybe even my own. You're saying, what growth rate did they use after year five? They used a 6% growth rate forever. My first reaction was, hey, what currency are you guys valuing the company in? Argentine pesos and you forgot to tell me? 6% in US dollar terms is an impossible valuation. Think of what will happen to Tesla if it grows 6% a year in US dollar terms. In an economy that's growing in nominal terms at 2 to 3%. In about 25 years, Tesla will be the US economy. Okay, globalization, let's keep going. In about 40 years, it'll be the global economy. I can't even visualize a world that's all Tesla all the time. You'd have to live in your Tesla, eat your Tesla, get entertainment from your Tesla, healthcare from your Tesla. I know Elon Musk is a really smart guy, but I don't think even he can devise that. And then what happens after you're 40? You're already the entire global economy. The only way I could make the story work was to bring SpaceX into my story. 
and discover Martians and then ship our Teslas to Mars. This is an impossible valuation. In fact, I'll be quite open. This is the crappiest discounted cash flow valuation I've ever seen. You know how much Everco got paid for this crappy job? Nine and a half million dollars. There's no justice in this world. Okay? So when you look at a fairness opinion, you're pretty much going to see impossible valuations half the time. So that's one example of an impossible valuation. Here's the second one. So about five years ago, somebody's valuing Netflix in the class. I'm sure there are quite a few of you valuing Netflix as well. Another reminder that you have a project and a company to pick and value. So it's about five years ago, somebody's valuing Netflix. Netflix is a fun, a fascinating company to value. But it's a company where it's really difficult to get a value much higher than the price because it's so richly priced. And this guy came up with a value five times higher than the price. I'm curious. What are you assuming that's allowing you to come up with such a high value? So I take a look at his discounted cash flow valuation and I notice his revenues are $600 billion, billion dollars in your 10, 600 billion. So I email him and say, can you come in and talk to me? So this was in the midway through the semester, the board, not for a grading, the feedback. So he comes into my office and I said, do you have Netflix? And he said, yes. And I said, how much do you pay for Netflix each year? Put out his calculator, seemed to be attached to his hip, click, click, and about $100 a year. Let me ask you a follow-up question. You have $600 billion in revenues in your 10. How many subscribers would Netflix need to have in your 10? He pulled out his calculator again, and I said, you don't need a damn calculator. You need about 6 billion subscribers. And I remember what he said. He said, I don't see where this questioning is going. I said, just hang in there. I have a couple more questions, and then you can leave. I said, what's the population of the world? He said, I have no idea. I have to go check Wikipedia. I said, I'll save you the trouble. It's about seven billion. And I asked him a second question. I said, I said I have, is this something you're holding back from me? Maybe there's a law that's been passed that says every man, woman, and child and household pet has to have their own Netflix account and they're not allowed to share. He said, don't be absurd. I said, I'm not the one estimating six billion subscribers. You are. He said, but I was just using last year's numbers. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, I took last year's user growth number and made it the growth rate every year for the next 10 years. Amazing what happens when Excel meets compounding. It's an impossible valuation. You and I can debate how much revenue Netflix can have in year 10, but it's definitely not going to be 100 billion. So one of the things I would strongly recommend you do is when you tell your story about a company, you put in the numbers and you come up with those revenues, look at your revenues in year 10 relative to your story and ask, Am I telling a fairy tale? Because if you are, you should stop. Sometimes you get stories about cost cutting companies. These are low growth companies. You're going to cut costs and you say, look, my growth is going to come because my margins are going to keep improving. And I say, okay, that's a reasonable story. For how long? You say for three years or five years, I'm all with you. But if you say forever, it can't happen. Why? If you keep cutting costs every year and your margins keep going up every year and you keep doing this every year and you never stop, your profit margins are going to get a hundred, hit 100% and keep going. That's an impossible valuation. And finally, a very technical, you know, impossible valuation. Many of you have done financial modeling valuations. You know that capex and depreciation are line items in your valuation. You add back depreciation, you subtract capex. And sometimes people project these line items separately. They take depreciation from the past and project it out and capex from the past and project out. And one of the problems that happens when you do this is if last year your company had less capex and depreciation, remember that can happen in any year, and you project this out in the future, you're effectively making depreciation higher than capex. Can that happen? Yeah, for a year, two years, maybe even five, but not forever. Why? Because you get to depreciate what you capex. So, if you, you, so when you have a valuation where depreciation is higher than capex forever, you've created an impossible valuation. So impossible valuations are fairy tales. There's no point even discussing what your beta should be or cost of capital should be if your valuation is impossible. What are implausible valuations? These are valuations where unlikely things are happening, but then you tell me a really good story to explain them. I'll stop. I'll give you an example. You have a company that's growing without much reinvestment. A couple of years ago, I had somebody in the class valuing a toll road company in Asia. And he put in a high growth rate with very little reinvestment. And I called him and said, what's going on? And he, and he gave me a story that completely explained it. He said, for the last 10 years, my toll road company has been investing in new toll roads. 
and that's you know that's the reinvestment it's already happened the toll roads have just opened so they're going to grow in the future so you're going to have high growth because you've already reinvested i said okay I'll give you a second example i valued a company called almara it's a saudi arabian dairy processing company and its margins were sky high almost twice as high as the margins of any other middle eastern food processing company i remember throwing the question out no how come there's not more competition? Because when your margins are that high in a food processing business, you expect competition to come in. And somebody gave me the answer. They said, have you looked at who the largest shareholders in Almaraya are? And I said, I haven't, but I should. And I checked. And the second largest shareholder in Almaraya was a part of the Saudi royal family. There's your competitive advantage, your barrier to entry. And I said, okay, I get it. So one way to check your valuations is what I call a valuation triangle. So try this out in your DCF. Because this is exactly what I'm, I'm going to pass feedback on. And you, get a, you can get a preemptive look. When you do a valuation, there are three big assumptions you make. One is about growth in the future. The second is about reinvestment in the future. And the third is about risk in the future. Growth, reinvestment, risk. So let's suppose I send you a DCF. And you look at my revenues and they're growing at 30% a year. I have a high growth company. If you have a high growth company, what should you expect to see? as reinvestment of the company, high, low, or non-existent with high growth companies. It should be high reinvestment, and generally you should see high risk. High, high, high makes sense. Low, low, low makes sense. High, low, low, it's not impossible. It might not even be implausible, but I'm going to push back. So when you send me a DCF, here's the first thing I'm going to check. I'm going to check your growth rate, and I'm going to tell you you're right or wrong. How do I know what's right or wrong? Then I want to check your reinvestment. So even if you have 100 line items, the difference between your after-tax earnings and your cash flow is your reinvestment. I'm going to check your reinvestment. If you have high growth, I'm checking to see whether you have high reinvestment. And then I'm going to check your cost of capital. Remember, the median cost of capital for a global company before this crisis was about 8%. Now it's almost 10%. If you're giving me a 6% cost of capital with high growth and high reinvestment, I'm going to push back and say, how come this company is such high growth and such low risk? I'm checking for inconsistencies. Am I back now? My, my audio got lost for a moment. Am I back? Okay. So basically, you're checking to see high growth, high reinvestment, high risk go together. Low growth, low re reinvestment, low risk go together. But if you have mismatches, tell me the story that explains those mismatches. You don't have to fix them, but just tell me how you explain those mismatches. So impossible, implausible, improbable. So I took my Uber story through this test. I said, is it probable, plausible, possible? Remember, in June of 2014, the story I told for Uber was actually as an urban car service company. And by June of 2014, it was succeeding as an urban car service company. So for me, it was a pretty easy defense to make. Look, they're already succeeding in big cities and towns. There's nothing I'm saying which they haven't done already. But I could have told you a much bigger story in June of 2014. I could have described Uber as a logistics company or a transportation company. And the bigger my story, the more defense I have to play because I have to justify the story. It's advice I give to founders of startups. Founders of startups are often told to tell really big stories about their company. And I said, be careful, because as your story gets bigger, the defense you have to offer for that story also has to get more intensive. And you're going to have a tougher time delivering on that story. So you've got to walk that balance between telling a story that's so big that you attract investors and a story that's so big you can't deliver on what that story requires. So I'm going to take a little tangent here and talk about what I call runaway stories. Okay? What's a runaway story? In a runaway story, you get three ingredients. Usually you get a storyteller, narrator, usually a founder who's charismatic and likable. Messiah-like. And the story they tell is just big and you just feel this urge to believe them. Second, they're telling a story about disrupting a business you've never much cared for or much liked. And third, as an added bonus, in the process, they're going to make the world a better place. So you've got a charismatic storyteller, you're disrupting a business nobody's liked, and you're going to make the world a better place in the process. Come on, don't you want the story to be true? Rather than give you abstract, let me give you a story. And you tell me whether you want the story to be true. It's about a 19-year-old who drops out of Stanford. Who does that? What was the acceptance rate at Stanford last year, like minus 
unless you are a synchronized swimmer and came in through the side door. You know, if not being following the news, the last part made no sense. But basically, one of the most selective universities in the world, this 19-year-old got in and dropped out to start a business. You're saying another tech guy dropping out to start a software business? No, this was different. It was a 19-year-old woman dropping out to start a blood testing business. Now, who loves the blood testing business? The way it's structured is terrible, right? You go to a lab, you wait an hour, they take your blood, take you know, two buckets of your blood, take six weeks to analyze the blood and then tell you that there's nothing wrong with you and charge you $2,000 for this privilege. Of course you want this business to be disrupted. So this 19-year-old woman is dropping out to start a business where she's going to take two drops of your blood, not two buckets of your blood, run it through 32 different blood tests and email you the results in 45 minutes. It's almost like she's in the 21st century and the whole thing will cost you less than $50. And you know what? As a bonus, she's also going to make this blood test available to parts of the world where people can't afford it and save healthcare around the world. Come on. Don't you want the story to be true? A 19-year-old woman starting a blood testing business is going to change the business and make the world a better place. I wish I was making up the story because it is true. It's the story of Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. Elizabeth Holmes, as you probably well know, was a 19-year-old who dropped out of Stanford and started Theranos. And Theranos, the company, took two drops of your blood in a nanotainer. Already it sounds 21st century. And very quickly ran the tests and made them available to you at a very low cost. And they were going to make the world a better place. And to show you that the story was, I mean, Everybody wanted the story to be true. Who's everybody? Venture capitalists wanted the story to be true. In fact, by October of 2015, early October, Theranos was priced at about $9 billion. And many of the venture capitalists in the list of investors in Theranos were among the best known venture capitalists in, in Silicon Valley. So this wasn't some you know, side players. These were big players. They bought into the Theranos story and wasn't just venture capitalists. Walgreens said they were going to have a Theranos lab in every Walgreens. They bought into the concept. And the Cleveland Clinic, one of America's leading healthcare organizations, said that they thought Theranos was going to be the future of blood testing. So in early October of 2015, if you ask me what I thought about Theranos, I said, look, they're a private company. We don't know much about them. But given the pricing and given the fact that Walgreens and, Ther and, and the Cleveland Clinic seem to find them OK, I think there must be something there. Let me ask you a question, though. If you're investing in a blood testing company, what's the first and biggest question you want to answer before you throw your money into the company? I would assume you want to know, does this blood test work? I assume somebody would have asked this question, but I was wrong. Because in October of 2015, a Wall Street Journal reporter decides to ask this question. Does this blood test work? Because on the Theranos website, they claimed that they had a new blood test, that their blood test and that they could test for 32 different things on the blood and give you the results in 45 minutes. So he said, do these blood tests work? So you went to the FDA. Because to market these blood tests, you got to get approved by the FDA. Went to the FDA and said, how many of these blood tests, these 32 blood tests that Theranos is advertising on its, on its website, has it been authorized to do? And the FDA said, we've given them permission on one of the 32, but on the other 31, they don't have approval yet. And he asked why, and the FDA said, well, because the tests are a little noisy. He said, what's a noisy blood test? Trust me, you don't want to have a noisy blood test. You go in for a noisy blood test, the results come back, the doctor looks in and says, look, you could be very sick, or you might be okay. Don't worry about it, go home. Not exactly the kind of finding you want in a blood test. You want precision. So the story comes out, Theranos pushes back, saying the Wall Street Journal is completely unmerited in its story, threatens to sue them. But over the next six months, the story unravels. Turns out that Theranos was cooking up the lab results, and six months later, the pricing of Theranos had gone to zero. The Cleveland Clinic and Walgreens had, had cut them off, themselves off from Theranos. Elizabeth Holmes had been banned from the blood testing business for three years, and she still faces a court, uh, court case that where she could go to jail. The whole business had come apart. And I remember writing a blog post in October of 2015. I'll send you the link to this blog post asking, how can this happen? How can VCs push up the pricing to $9 billion? Where was the corporate governance? And one of the questions I looked at was, what are the board of directors doing? And I took one look at the board, and my first reaction was, he's still alive? Him too? George Schultz? He was the CEO 
I'm sorry, he was the Secretary of State under Ronald Reagan in 1981. He's a sprightly 94. Henry Kissinger, what the heck is he doing on the board of a blood testing uh, company? I mean, my only reaction was a cynical one, which is if you're a megalomaniac CEO, and remember, megalomania is not restricted to middle-aged men. You could be a 23-year-old woman with megalomania, and you want to create a board that would never ask you a question. Here's an idea. Get a group of 80 to 90-year-olds, put them on your board, you know, Invite them to a board meeting, put a pillow in front of every chair. You never know when they might fall asleep. Have a backup ambulance and you'll never get asked a question. Corporate governance is not just for public companies, for private business as well. So the question about how did this happen is everybody wanted the story to be true. In fact, I'll go further. In October of 2015, when I wrote that post, I asked a question for myself. I said, in, if let's say it had been four months earlier before the Wall Street Journal story and I'd been sitting in at a, at, a, at a conference in New York City, Elizabeth Holmes, one of the most celebrated women in America. You had, you had people bring their daughters to the conference because they wanted them to see that this young woman had made a, a, a self-made billionaire. So you'd, you'd have been in this audience of people who were just worshipping Elizabeth Holmes. I, the question I asked myself is, would I have had the courage to put up my hand and ask the question? You know what the question would have been? Does your blood test work? Because I'd have been afraid to know the answer. What if she said, no, the blood test doesn't work? I'd have felt like the guy who shot Bambi's mother. I've always felt sorry for that guy. Remember the Bambi movie, in the Disney movie, it starts with the deer falling in the forest. I always felt badly for that guy who shot that deer. He must have had therapy for years after that. Because you want the story to be true. What I'm trying to say is, when you want something to be true, as human beings, we'll find ways to delude ourselves to stop asking questions. And that's why I'm wary of companies that wrap themselves in social benefits and good, because it means that people stop asking tough questions. It's the same issue I had with WeWork. And one of the problems with the runaway stories is at some point, runaway stories become meltdown stories because the person telling the story develops you know, feet of clay. In fact, the meltdown story is what happens. A storyteller that was your messiah, you discover his feet of clay. Then you discover very quickly that the story they've been telling is at war with the numbers and that the business model doesn't work. In the case of WeWork, think of how quickly they went from a runaway story worth $47 billion to a meltdown story worth close to nothing. So when you see runaway stories, kind of check yourself because it's easy to fall into the trap of saying, I want the story to be true. I'm going to stop asking questions. One can final... One, go ahead. Can you talk about where Theranos crossed over the line where it became securities fraud? Is it because they were putting... But remember, they were not a public... No, but right, they were not a publicly traded company. So how can it be securities fraud? You can talk about individual they, fraud, right? The venture, venture capitalists could have asked the question, so they could have asked for more information. So this is not something the SEC can cover. This is something that's between, and it can't do it. it. This is going to be there as long as people have hope and there are messiah-like CEOs. So Theranos was not a public company. So this was not a question of fooling the stockholders. This was about VCs so falling in love with the story that they did not ask the right questions. In fact, if you get a chance, there's a documentary on Theranos where they talk about how people try to ask questions of the company and how quickly the venture capitalists, Ted Draper, in fact, dressed down people who tried to ask. Ted Draper is, of course, one of legendary VCs, a VC in, um, in Theranos, was talked, you know, essentially dressed down a journalist for asking questions about Theranos, saying you don't understand how big this, this story is and how great this mission is. So it's human nature. So I don't think it's a securities fraud issue as much as an issue of, I believe that Theranos itself fell into, believed its own hype. They thought that if they cooked the books long enough that the, this would start to work out. So it's a collective delusion. The founder believes it, the VCs believe it, you know. It's, um, I, in fact, I have a paper called The Big Market Delusion, which I'll send a link to as well, which I think it happens in every big market. You fall in love with the story and you, you're overconfident and you kind of go with the story. So, you know, unfortunately, Theranos will not be the last. WeWork will not be the last. There'll be other stories like this, you know, and we're all, you know, we're all going to fall for those stories because we want the stories to be true. 
And Colin mentions Bad Blood is the movie that was made out of the book. But the book was called the Wall Street Journal reporter who wrote the article made it into a book called Bad Blood. And Bad Blood was is a movie on HBO. That's you know are you talking about the, the, the documentary might be Bad Blood, but there's also a movie with the with the with the, with, the, with what's her name from Hunger Games acting as Elizabeth Holmes. So it's it's all it's it's almost unbelievable that a story like this can get this big but i've seen it happen before and it'll continue to happen in the future which brings me to f two final aspects of this possible plausible probable now it's, as i said one of the things that happens when you have a big market is you have people get interested in conquering the market and often you no know, so let's assume you have a really big market it could be china it could be artificial intelligence it could be whatever and you're an entrepreneur looking at that big market let me ask you a question if you're an entrepreneur, you know some entrepreneurs, you should be able to answer this question. Are entrepreneurs in general overconfident people or diffident people? Overconfident. Overconfident people, right? That's what makes you an entrepreneur. You're an overconfident person. So you're an overconfident entrepreneur looking at a big market. You think you can conquer it. You seek out some venture capitalists. Let me ask you a question about venture capitalists. Are venture capitalists in general overconfident people or diffident people? Well, they tend to be overconfident people as well. They think they can pick winners. So you have an overconfident entrepreneur who attracts VCs who think they've picked a winner. You've got a cluster of overconfident people looking at a big market. And you have a hundred clusters like this out there in Silicon Valley. And each cluster thinks that they have the answer. So within each cluster, when you look at their valuations, what are you going to get? You're going to get a really high value because they think they're going to be the winners. If I add up the values across the clusters, you know what I'm going to find? That the collective value that I get is too large. This is what I call the big market delusion. It happened with PCs in the 1980s. I'm old enough to remember that. It happened with dot-com stocks in the 1990s, the e-commerce. It happened with online advertising in the last decade. It happened with cannabis just three years ago. We see a big market of all these young companies. Each company thinks it has the answer. It's run by overconfident people and overconfident VCs and investors within each company. The collective value will be too much. So it's something to think about as you look at some markets and essentially it's, it's well worth you know, spending some time thinking about this phenomenon. Which brings me to one final example before we let this topic go. So we've talked about impossible, improbable, um, improv. and one of the companies I've talked off and on about is Tesla. And Tesla is a company, as, as I've described before, that doesn't have investors. It has fans. So including its equity research analysts. So this was in mid-2013. I'd done a valuation of Tesla on my, on my blog. I valued it about $150 per share, which I thought was a rich valuation given where Tesla was then, selling about 24,000 cars. Now I find this equity research report where the equity research analyst has valued the company at $600 per share. So I'm wondering, what's he assume that allows him to get that higher value? So it's a well-known investment bank's equity research report. I won't name the bank. I pull up the equity research report. It's about 250 pages long. And there's a D.C.F on page 53. That's how we described it. And I'm going to stay with this terminology, a D.C.F. So I look to see what is D.C.F is giving him that gives him 600 billion so this is his d.c.f the cash flows so he's basically projecting with a lot of optimism that car the number of cars tesla will sell will go from 24000 to 1.1 million but his revenues are actually pretty close to my projections so i'm a little puzzled his revenues are pretty close to mine how come his value is so much higher maybe his margins are tech company margins so I look at his margins and his margins are actually lower than mine now i'm befuddled he has revenues like mine, margins lower than mine, but his value is four times higher. So what's he assuming? So I keep going down. And as I said, one of the tricks I've learned when I've looked at DCFs to figure out what people are reinvesting is to focus on the after-tax earnings, which is hidden here because he does a net income and the free cash flow. You take the difference between your after-tax earnings and your free cash flow. Roughly speaking, that is your reinvestment that you're putting back, no matter how many line items you have in the middle. So I took his cumulative after-tax operating income for the next 15 years and his cumulative free cash flow. And it turned out that over the next 15 years, this guy was assuming that Tesla was reinvesting almost nothing. Let me pause right there. He's assuming that the number of cars Tesla will sell will increase from 24,000 to 1.1 million, but he's reinvesting almost nothing. Do you see the problem here? Tesla in 2013 had one assembly plant in Fremont. 
with a capacity on an, on an incredibly good day of 200,000 cars. You're selling 1.1 million cars. Where are the extra 900,000 cars going to come from if you're not building fresh assembly lines? So I called the equity research analyst and he said, I cannot talk about the numbers. A team comes up with these numbers. I said, a team came up with this DCF? Yeah, he said, a team of five. And he was on his way to California, had no to do what, maybe to worship at a Tesla shrine or whatever he, he went to California for. But I said, can I call you and your team's around you? So a week later, he, he said, you know, I'll be back in a week, you can call me then. I called the entire teams with him. So he comes on and I said, what do you do? And he says, look, I don't work with the numbers. And I said, what exactly do you do? And he said, I schmooze. Yes. You know what schmoozing is, right? He talks, he talks to analysts, he talks to experts, he talks to Tesla managers. He said, I'm a schmoozer. I said, okay, what's your second in command do? He said, I'm the secondary schmoozer. I go with this guy. When he schmoozes, I schmooze with him. And I said, what's the third in command do? He said, I'm the backup schmoozer. If one of these guys can't schmooze, I schmooze instead. I said, who in this group doesn't schmooze? And they point to a 24-year-old kid. They hired out of Wharton last year. You know, and this poor kid is, you know, smart kid, but he's the number cruncher. He said, he did it. I feel really bad for this kid. But I lead him through the process and he gets it. So I said, what happened? He said, it slipped my mind. I said, what slipped your mind? He said, putting in assembly plans, investment for assembly plans in the future. I just took last year's numbers and projected them out and I missed it. It slipped my mind. I said, do you think it's a problem? And he said, of course it's a problem. And he said, but he says, look, I don't know what to do about it. We can't go to the market and tell them we forgot to put in assembly plans. He said, that would not look good. I said, I agree, it would not look good. So I gave him a suggestion, which he did not take. I said, have you seen this movie, Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory? He said, no, I haven't. But one of the older analysts had. And I said, one of the things that always puzzled me about the movie was you had one, one factory. Willy Wonka had one factory. I don't know whether any of you have seen this movie, but it was a very inefficiently laid out factory with like chocolate rivers running through it. My question was, how does that one factory produce enough chocolates to be in every store in the world? Willy Wonka chocolates are everywhere. And the answer is actually in the movie. It's these magical creatures called Oompa Loompas. If you get a chance, go on Google and type in Oompa Loompa. They dance, and while they dance, chocolates come flying out of the factory. So I made a suggestion. I said, why don't you put out a press release? And here's what it needs to say. Tesla has laid off all of its Fremont plant workers and replaced them with Oompa Loompas. I call these Oompa Loompa valuations. And you'd be amazed at how many discounted cash flow valuations I see, which are Oompa Loompa valuations. So I'm going to stop right there, but here's what I'd like you to do before Wednesday's class. I want you to take your company. You don't even have to put any spreadsheets. Start thinking about your story. Think about the questions you will ask to make sure it's possible, plausible, probable. And then next session, I'm going to talk about connecting your story to numbers and evaluation, the levers that I use. And the way I built the spreadsheet is to actually make it easy for you to take any story and put it into that spreadsheet. I'll take you through the process of the levers you can use to convert your story to numbers and how the numbers become evaluation. So I, I've just a minute at the end. I'm going to let you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you ask any questions you might have for you know a couple of minutes at least before we wrap up because um, I know you're exhausted watching online. But I'm sorry the audio went in and out a couple of times. But overall, I think it was pretty good, right? The audio. Yeah. But any questions you have about anything to do with your valuations, with you know, what's do, if you're interested, I put up my fourth weekly update. I keep wishing, wishing with each one that this is the last week on my blog. So please do read it. It is completely and totally about what's going on around you. And if you're losing sight of your, it's easy when you're in a crisis like this to get so focused on what's right in front of you. That you can't that you lose perspective. So if you get a chance, read the post and tell me what you think. But um, any questions? I have oh, one quick question. Yeah. Did you say that you sometimes just look at the difference between net income yeah. and... Not net income, net after tax, operating income, and free cash flow to the firm. That's a proxy for... No, it's so not sometimes. It's actually, that's actually reinvestment. After tax, operating income minus free cash flow to the firm is reinvestment, right? Net capex, acquisitions, change in working capital are all the intermediate line items. But if you just take the top number, after tax operating income, and the bottom number free cash flow to the firm, and you take the difference, that is your total reinvestment. Got it. Thanks. Any other questions, folks?
No questions? Okay, then I'm going to wrap up and um, I will, I've actually recorded this on my computer as well while I was doing the Zoom session. So I'll make it into a YouTube video for those of you who might have trouble with Zoom because your broadband is whatever, you know. So as I said, there'll be multiple ways of getting to it. And the webcast page for the class is the place you should go to to get pretty much everything. And I'll continue with my practice of an email a day. I'm not going to let you off the hook. I'm going to nag you like crazy. And I know it's a tough time, but we'll get through this. But thank you. No other questions. I'm going to wrap up.